Number one, your dreams matter, period. Number two, having dreams and fanning the flame of those dreams. It's going to make you 10 times more successful than ignoring them. Number three, your dreams are your responsibility. And that's a good thing. Because when you accept responsibility for not only tapping into those dreams and giving yourself permission to claim those dreams and to feel those dreams and to work toward those dreams, you take responsibility for creating meaning in your life, for momentum, for growth, for goodness, for purpose, like all the good stuff that you deserve. And so the times in my life where I have given myself permission to dream, to want something, to just desire the things that I want just because I desire them, that's when I'm on fire in life. That's when things are working. When I'm arguing against myself, when I'm putting out my own flame, that's when I'm miserable. And so today, we are going to get a master class in knocking it off. You're going to get a master coaching session. In fact, you're going to get to listen in live where I'm coaching somebody else and I'm going to like use this coaching session that happened a couple weeks ago in Los Angeles as a way to hold your hand and step-by-step step coach you, coach you on recognizing what your dreams are and to coach you on knocking it off. Your dreams are not a joke. Your dreams are serious business. And today we are going to get into the business of your dreams. And then I'm going to coach you on a simple thing you can do every single day to get deeply connected to those dreams, to train your brain to help you achieve those dreams. And don't you worry. Don't you worry. We're going to do lots of other episodes about tools and momentum and continuing to make them a reality. But we got to get clear that your dreams matter. Enough with denying, okay? So here's how we're going to do this. A couple weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles, and I was doing a live event with a friend of mine named Kathy Heller. Now, you may know of Kathy Heller. She's an incredible podcaster, and she is a best-selling author, and she and I did this live event. It's really awesome with this audience uh, in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. And during the event, it was my birthday. Kathy surprised me with a birthday cake. And her sister, Barbara, came up. And her sister, Barbara, is this really awesome comedian and actor. And she did an impersonation of me. Here's the catch. One of my gifts is I have, I'd say, 100% accurate intuition. And the second Barbara got on that stage, my intuition went crazy. And I just knew this was a person who had given up on her dreams. And so I decided to go there. And what you're about to listen in on is a coaching session between me and a woman named Barbara. Barbara has a dream. She's very clear about what it is. Since she was 18 years old, she has known that she has wanted to be an actor. She has known that she has wanted to tour as a comic. She's known that she's loved to have a stand-up special on Netflix. She has been working at it, everyone, for over 25 years. She has come so close. And when I met her a couple weeks ago, she had given up on that dream. She had left L.A. She had moved to Florida. And little did she know, she was about to get an ass-kicking of a lifetime. Okay, got it. Mel, how do I get started? How do I achieve this? <laughs> okay, this has been fun, girl, but this is a lot like buying a brand new planner for the new school year. So now what do I do? Okay, well, step number one. Based on the research, the second that you define your goals, and we have now defined the goals, we are using the research, I'm feeling super empowered, I hope you are too, you have to make the first milestone super, super easy because that means it feels like you've already done it, okay? So we got to make a super simple first step and scientists even have a name for this. Scientists call this incremental illusion. That's what we're using, incremental illusion. If you make the first few milestones really easy to achieve, 
you will be more likely to succeed at this goal because nothing, and I mean nothing, is more motivating than progress. And research from the University of Chicago gives us a great example of what I'm talking about, okay? So you know how you go to a coffee shop and they have these offers where if you buy 10 cups of coffee, you get the next coffee free. Here's a little trick that's pretty interesting that uses this effect, this illusion, okay? So they gave one group of people a card that was buy 10 cups of coffee, get one free card, but it was blank, okay? They gave another group of people a buy 12 cups of coffee, and then you get a free card, but two of the slots were already checked off. Progress had already been made. It's still the same thing. You're still having to do 10, but guess what? The folks that were given the card with two slots already filled in, they moved through that card faster by checking the boxes twice. Listening to this podcast, check. You're no longer at square one. You've defined your goals. Uh, I can tell you some other things. You want to do the smallest step possible. Chris gave me a book about dahlias, those flowers that I love for the holidays. Check. I'm in box two. (laughs) If you can take the smallest step today, can you do a Google search? Could you spend a little time journaling? What's something that you could do? You can't think of something? No problem. I've got something based on the research you could do. Step number two, check box number two. Tell someone you admire about this goal. This debunks decades old research from 2009 from researchers at Yale that said that you shouldn't tell anybody about your goals. But here's the hook. You need to tell somebody you admire. You got to tell the right people about your goals. This comes from a set of new studies from Ohio State. Researchers found that you show greater goal commitment and performance when you tell your goal to someone you admire or whose opinion you value. And these results run counter to this widely reported 2009 study from NYU that suggested that telling other people your goal is actually counterproductive. And so here's what you can do. Just tell somebody you admire. Here's how I'm doing it. I'm sharing these goals with you. And I'm going to go share these goals with my family. And I'm going to share these goals with my friends. I'm going to talk to the woman that I met this summer that is growing dahlias and learn from her. That's another step. This is like us checking off the boxes on that free coffee card and getting you to start seeing yourself making progress. And the final thing, the second that this episode is over, do a tiny thing, one step forward. This comes from a recent study at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine that showed that starting right away resulted in the most change. Do not wait for Monday. Do not wait for the weekend. Do not wait until later. The most important thing you could do, that little box you're going to check, is when this podcast is over, spend five minutes taking a step. Whew. Now I get to talk about the most life-changing part of all of this. You ready? The whole reason why goal setting is important is because it creates meaning and purpose in your life. And that's the most important part. Your goals are not really meant to be achieved. The most important part is that you're pursuing something. That's why goals matter so much. I mean, remember the research we talked about in the very beginning? Those goals that you've defined and refined based on the research, having them, taking little steps toward them, it's going to make you happier. It will suppress negative emotions. It makes you feel like you're up to something. And your life is going to be way more satisfying having those one, two, or three goals that you're working on than having no goals at all. And there's a reason why I'm going to hammer this idea of pursuing the goal, okay? First of all, I don't want you to try to get this perfect. I just want you to try. And the second reason why is that when you achieve a goal, the irony is It's not as satisfying as you think it's going to be. Setting goals 
makes you happy. Working on goals makes you happy. Achieving goals does not create or promise lasting happiness. Yeah, it is awesome when you finally get to the top of that mountain you've been climbing. You take in the view, you catch your breath, you sit down on a rock, you take a selfie, you eat some gorp, and then you stand up and you climb back down. It's over. Yeah, it's amazing when you pay off your bills. You celebrate, you feel the burst of pride, and then you go on with life. The point and the purpose of achieving and setting goals that are deeply personal, that have a will and a why and a how and a way, right, is because when you have goals, you're up to something. You're committing to your own growth and you're getting intentional about things that are relevant and important that you want to see yourself doing. And we have a tendency to overestimate how happy we're going to be when we achieve the goal. And there's even a name for it. That's how common this is. It's called the arrival fallacy. It's this fallacy that once you lose the weight, once you get the job, once you find the romance, once you reach the destination, that then, then I'll be in nirvana. Then I'll be happy. Then, I'll, no. Tal Ben Shara, the Harvard trained positivity psychology expert, he has debunked this thing in study after study after study. And all you have to do is look at the number of Olympians or movie stars that we think have achieved it all that then are just plummeting and struggling with mental health illnesses after their greatest achievements. And we're like, what? How could they possibly do? They have gold medals. They have millions of dollars. Well, because they're not working toward anything that matters. It was working toward the gold medal, working to make that movie going to auditions and pushing through the failure and having this goal that you set for yourself, working on it is what gives your life meaning. And that's why I wanted to start this series of life-changing episodes of the Mel Robbins podcast, the foundational stuff about how you create a better life with goal setting. Because goal setting from this point forward must be a part of your life if you want to feel a greater sense of purpose and meaning, period. And so I want you to come back to this episode. I want you to bookmark it. I want you to share this with people that you care about. If you've got somebody like I do who's a college senior and as they approach graduation and they start to feel like they're about to have a quarter life crisis and they're lost, you know what they need? They need goals. If you have a friend going through divorce, you know what they need? They need goals. If you're bored in life or feeling stuck or you've got to hit the reinvention button, you know what you need? You need goals. And you can re-listen to this every single quarter at any moment in your life and walk yourself through this very simple but powerful and life-changing research to get very clear about what you want and why you want it and how you're going to go achieve it. Now, speaking about the how, you want to know how? Habits are how you achieve goals. Systems are how you make it easier. And so coming up next in this life-changing series, we're going to do a 101 on habits. What the science says about habits, the three components that make a new habit encode and stick in your brain. And we're also going to give you the research-backed shortcuts that you can use to make new habits stick and to make that change and the new habits that are going to help you achieve your goals easier to implement in your life. That's what's coming next. But for now, I want you to remember the definition of a goal. A goal is anything that you desire that wouldn't otherwise happen without you doing something. And what I want you to do next is I want you to take one step forward on that goal of yours. I want to start with um, a particular post that you put on social media that went crazy viral and it really struck a nerve for me. And you posted this thing where you said, at 32 years old, I realized I was a child in an adult body. And this just hit deep for so many people. What did you mean? What I 
Thank you um, for for calling out that post. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of us, that that can be really challenging um, to hear that about ourselves. And for me, if I'm speaking honestly, it was very challenging to come to that awareness. And what I met was mainly around my emotions and the way that I hadn't learned, um, of course, in early childhood, to to tolerate, to navigate, to be able to process my emotions. And in many ways, and I use this language, I think this is the, the part that becomes difficult is in a lot of ways, I was very emotionally immature in the way that I handled the frustrations, the difficulties and the stresses of life. Because the reality for me, as I think is the case, which is I think why it resonates force with so many of us is that so few of us for many different reasons, which I'm sure we'll dive into many of which today, um, we didn't have those safe environments. We didn't have those emotionally attuned caregivers who themselves learned how to navigate their own emotions. So, I mean, needless to say, parenting is a, is a large, large task in and of itself. And, you know, when we don't have that safety and when we don't have someone modeling, mirroring, attuning to us emotionally, what we do then appear is like a child in an adult body. I want to take a step back because for those of you who have not uh, read Dr. Nicole's New York Times number one bestselling book, which is a game changer, how to do the work, um, I or you don't follow her online like millions and millions and millions of people do. Can you tell everybody what your life looked like at the age of 32? Because, you know, when you talk about emotional immaturity, it's not like you were running down the street naked, taking a baseball bat to the side of a wall, like kind of rambling gobbledygook. You were high functionally high functioning and successful. So we just give everybody like, what does life for Dr. Nicole at 32 look like when you have this realization that, holy shit, I can't process my emotions maturely. Yeah. And, and I'll be the first to say, I wasn't able to even admit that or even have that language um, for what was going on at the time. What I did know was that I had finally arrived or so I thought to the end of all of this, you know, achievement based to do list, um, to speak to your point, I I wasn't, you know, kind of dysfunctional in the very traditional sense. I had, in a lot of ways, I had the successful, you know, life or at least appearance of life around me. Um, I was in a partnership, a committed partnership. I had a successful practice after achieving my PhD. Um, I was surrounded by, you know, a network of supportive individuals. I was living in the city that I chose to live in. Everything seemingly on the outside, right, was reflecting this idea that I should feel good or at least better than I was. So I, you know, I think as a lot of us do, my first feeling was a really low, a disempowered lack of fulfillment and shame. Um, because again, as I looked around, I kept almost telling myself, well, what is wrong with you, Nicole? Why aren't you, you know, feeling good about yourself? Why aren't you feeling fulfilled? Why aren't you feeling even connected to this life that you created? So not having the awareness of, of why I was struggling right alongside with, at that point, the clients that I had been working with week after week, month after month, um, I kept I wondering, you know, feeling as a disempowered then clinician in the room, what is wrong? Why are so many of us stuck? Those of us who even have access to supportive individuals like myself in a therapeutic environment, why is the report I'm getting week after week, not that I'm getting better, but that I'm getting more and more frustrated, more and more shameful, more and more stuck in these patterns. And for me, it really began with exploring, you know, what is keeping so many of us stuck? Um, and for me, I landed on the answer being all of the conditioning, oftentimes very stress-based, very trauma-based conditioning that, you know, was emblematic of the childhoods that most of us have grown up in that were creating habits and patterns that no matter how much insight, how much awareness that we had, were keeping us disconnected from ourselves, from our life and from our relationships. So as you are talking and somebody's listening intently, going, wait a minute, is there a different way to experience life? <laughs> uh, you know, because adulthood, it's so familiar sounding that you check all the boxes. Ivy League degree, you know, you're practicing psychologist, you are uh, successful on the outside, you're surrounded by all these people, and you're having this internal crisis and disconnect where you're going, why am I not happy? What, what is wrong with me? 
What more could there be? How can I not figure this out? I am sure most everybody listening can relate to this. And so we're going to get into what you did. But if somebody is going, that's me, that's me right now. What is something, Dr. Nicole, that you want to tell them right now about what this means if you're experiencing this disconnection from what your life is like today and what you're feeling inside? You know, I speaking from the perspective of, of having been that person, I mean, as I, you know, was entering my 30s, I convinced myself because I too saw similar, you know, complaints. I heard similar complaints and I almost gaslit myself in a lot of ways with this idea, like you're sharing, Mal, of this, this must be just what adulthood is. Um, this might just be the circumstances of the, you know, environments, very unnatural. I was living in a city myself that many of us are living. And it took me, you know, becoming conscious again of the very real impact of these habits and patterns to create just that little bit of space. So what I want to offer to anyone who's resonating and has that embedded belief that this is just what life is about, or maybe, you know, a, a more problematic belief, I think for ourselves is maybe this is just what my life is meant to be about. Maybe there's something inherently wrong with me, you know, that is translating to this lack of fulfillment, this overwhelming stress or whatever it might be for you. And so very much speaking from that person as well, I thought that something was just, you know, off about me. Um, I want to share, you know, the hope of creating that space of really, and you'll often hear me break down as far as I see the process of creating change into two major steps. And the first step I will always note is becoming conscious. And when we become conscious of how habitual, how patterned we are as individuals, then some of us can gift us with that little bit of space that then allows us to take that next step, which is beginning to make new choices outside of those old ingrained habits to then be able to experience ourself differently. And I'm really being intentional with that because again, I think the best, you know, the best shifting of beliefs is when we ourselves begin to create change, begin to experience life differently. Many of us, I'm sure have listened to motivational speakers who have said, oh, you can do this, you know, come on this side of, of life of change. And it really isn't. And again, speaking from my own experience of this, we don't believe it until we do it. But when mm. we be, do become conscious or as we begin to become conscious, we can gift ourselves with that space. Of course, does not happen overnight, but over time, we can begin to then make new choices, relieving ourselves of that shame, that belief that this is just what life is all about and or this is what my life is all about. Well, this is one of the reasons why I love you so much, not only because you've made a huge difference in my life, and I'm going to try to take a highlighter and call out a couple of those things that you have said that were complete paradigm shifters for me and helped me achieve level up moments in my own healing. And so I want to um, just, un I want to make sure everybody heard something, which is even the awareness that you feel stuck, even the awareness that something is off, even the awareness that this isn't working is great news. Because if I'm hearing you correctly, being frustrated or feeling discombobulated in your body about your life that is the consciousness that you're talking about? Yes, 100%. I mean, anything that we can attune to feeling, even the lack of, because I know for a lot of us, we feel numb. Um, for me, that was very par much part of my journey um, is feeling apathetic, not actually feeling much of anything. Though to speak to your you know, very beautiful celebration of that awareness, the moment we start to say, okay, you know, I don't feel anything or I feel so depressed or whatever it is that I do feel when I am able to see or witness. That's what consciousness means to, for me. And honestly acknowledge that that's the case for my circumstances, then we are actually beginning the process of creating change. Yeah, this is going on right now in real time in my life because we were just having dinner last night for my husband's birthday and our daughter um, has asked my husband, when do you feel most alive? What experiences make you feel most alive? And after Chris answered, I turned to her and I said, I've heard you say that word alive a number of times. Where is that coming from? And she said, well, it's because I don't feel that alive in my life right now. 
And I think when you have those insights, you're right to go, you know, I was celebratory because I'm trying to highlight the fact that most of us react to that insight that, holy shit, I I don't feel excited by my life. I don't feel like myself. I don't feel alive. It's scary when you have that moment of consciousness. It's in- incredibly scary, you know, feeling um, as many of us do when we're on that blind autopilot, especially if our autopilot is driven by a, a state of nervous system disconnection. I often connect many of the conversations, many of the habits and patterns that we're beginning to talk about now back to our physiological body. Um, and there actually is a state of shutdown that many of us, I found myself living in that created, it. And it wasn't to say like you were, we were going back to the beginning, right? I was still marching through life, you know, checking endless boxes of to-do list. It wasn't that I was apathetic sitting on a couch though. For some of us, that's how it presents. We don't feel motivated. We procrastinate. We actually can't get up and do much of anything though. Some of us are still able to continue to literally just live life going through the motions and our emotions are what makes us a human. So feeling very much, I talk about my spaceship that I was living on, the spaceship of disconnection that again began for me in childhood does create this feeling, this embodied existence of living like a robot. So when we rob ourselves of our emotional experience of life, we're robbing ourselves, in my opinion, of life itself. But again, as often as the case, there are reasons embedded in our mind and our body that have created that experience, even of that distance, that disconnect, that apathy, that lack of motivation, that procrastination, whatever it is, that isn't a reflection of who you really are, what is meant for you in life, but again, is an adaptive coping mechanism, usually around your earliest environments or circumstances. Actually, you know what? I'm going to commit right now to letting go of making myself wrong. Good job, Mel Robbins, for getting out there. Good job for trying out an episode where I would be walking and talking and recording it on my iPhone. And good job for having the presence of mind to realize it would be a better listening experience for you and a better experience for me to unpack this really important topic of letting go. How do you let go of what no longer serves you? I got to say, I get questions about this all the time. In fact, just yesterday, I got this question from Cheryl. Mel, how do you know that the thing you're holding on to is meant to be let go of versus fighting for it even harder? Do you have any thoughts or perhaps tools to help discover it or encourage the universe to bring that epiphany along? In other words, how do I know when it's time to let go? All right, everybody. Get ready, because this is one of the most important aspects of creating a better life and of being a happier person. We spend so much time focusing on what we need to do, what we need to add in, what we need to change. And have you stopped to consider that the best place to make a change is by letting go of things, of projects, of thinking patterns, of relationships that no longer serve you? And the big question is how? How do you know when it's time? And I have got not only a fantastic visual metaphor to help you understand this concept, but I also have a really interesting way to approach this. We're going to talk about the fact that your energy and your intuition is always there to tell you when it's time to let something go because it no longer serves you. So to get into this topic, I want to introduce the metaphor. And it was the metaphor I had started talking about as we were on that hike together. I mean, here in the United States anyways, it is autumn. It is the fall season. We are all about pumpkins. We are in harvest time. There are corn stalks everywhere. We're getting ready for orange and red and all those amazing colors and carrot cake. I mean, I love this time of year. And I realize it may not be fall where you are. Uh, if you're you know, part of our global fan base halfway around the world, it's summertime. Don't get hung up on the fact that I'm using fall as a metaphor. I personally believe whenever it is that you are listening to this episode, even if it's two years from now, you're listening to this right now because you are meant to hear it right now. 
because there is a new season that needs to start in your life. And that's going to require you to let go of things that no longer serve you. And so let's talk about the metaphor of what happens to a tree when the fall season hits. And in researching this for you, because, you know, it's one thing to just kind of tell you a metaphor. It's another thing to really understand it and explain it. This was fascinating. I know we, we learned about chlorophyll and fall and the life cycle of a tree in elementary school, but I had forgotten most of this stuff. So check this out. The reason why a tree has leaves is because the tree needs energy to survive. It needs energy to grow. And the leaves have a very particular purpose. The leaves are there to take the sunlight and convert it to energy so that the tree can grow. And in exchange, the tree gives a ton of water back to these leaves. I mean, this process of the leaves sprouting and the leaves growing and the leaves taking its surface area and converting the sun into energy so the tree can go from a tiny little acorn to a mighty oak, that is a lot of energy. And there's this reciprocal nature to the relationship that a tree has to its leaves because the tree has to bring in tons of water in order to fuel this energy exchange. And here's the reason why leaves fall off a tree. In the middle of winter, at least here in the United States, when the ground is frozen and snowpack is on top, there is no water for the tree. And if those leaves with their big flat surface were to stay on that tree through winter, the leaves would kill the tree. It would suck the tree dry of all the water that it needs. An interesting thing about fall is that, you know, we look at the, the leaves turning and we look at the leaves dropping gently and falling down to the ground as this beautiful thing that happens, this natural thing that happens. It's so lovely. It's just wonderful. Isn't this delightful? Do you want to know that this is almost like a violent act, that the trees are pushing those leaves off its branches. The tree is basically going, yo, uh, if you are hanging around on my branches through the winter time, you are going to suck me dry of all my energy. I am going to die if you don't get off my freaking branches. The tree literally pushes them, ejects them, kicks them out of their life. Why? Because there is no reciprocal energy exchange that can happen during the winter. The tree has to conserve its energy to survive. And after the winter season, once those leaves are gone and the tree can conserve its energy instead of giving it all to that leaf while killing itself. I bet you got areas of your life where you're giving all your energy into a relationship or into your work or into some stupid thinking pattern that you've been doing for years that makes you feel bad. You put all your energy in one direction. You get nothing in return. That's what fall is for a tree. The fall season for a tree is, thank you very much for spring and summer. You were amazing. This relationship between the leaf and the tree, this was reciprocal. You got energy from me. I got energy from you. Bada bing, bada boom. And then all of a sudden, boom. This is a one-way thing. And if I hold on to these leaves, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm bringing that metaphor and that visual and that 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 documented point of view that this isn't just some lovely thing where the leaves you know change colors and it's so beautiful and now we all drink a pup, pumpkin spice latte that's not what this is this is a tree's survival this is about energy this is about the fact that in order to grow in order to be strong to be the best you you got to surround yourself with relationships and work and projects and friendships and habits where there is an equal reciprocal exchange that you give and you get and return. And that's where we're going to start when it comes to how I want you to think about this concept of letting go. We're going to talk about how to identify that moment when there is no longer that energy exchange 
that there is something that has become a complete energy suck. And when you realize, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a job or some habit or a place that you live, when you realize that something has become an energy suck on you, that's when you know it's time to let go. That's when you know, like that tree, that you better kick that thing off your branches because it's hanging on to you or you're holding on to it. And if you keep doing that, what will happen? And you've had this happen in your life where you've held on to things for too long, where you refuse to let things go. And what did it do? It sucked you dry. It sucked you dry of your energy. It sucked you dry of your vitality. It made you feel depleted. Instead of those leaves or that project or that person withering away and, and falling to the ground so that you could regain your strength, so that you could step into a new season of your life, no, you gave it all to them. You held on for too long. Well, guess what? That's not happening anymore. Because what we're going to talk about when we come back from a short word from our sponsors, which I want you to listen to, because by the way, our sponsors, they're the reason why I can show up twice a week. There is a reciprocal exchange between us. They literally pay for this show, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So we can put this out there around the world for free. So I want to give an energy exchange back to the amazing sponsors of the Mel Robbins podcast. Take a listen. We're going to be right back. Because we're going to now talk about, in detail, what do I mean by reciprocal energy exchange? And where are the major areas in your life where you tend to start to have this be a one-way thing, where you're given all the energy and you're the one that's depleted and dry? All right. I'll be right back. You hang on to my branches. We're not done yet. It's really green right now, which means these trees are holding on to it. Chlorophyll. That chlorophyll is coming through, but in literally a matter of days, the green is gonna leave those leaves, yellow, orange, red, brown, purple. It's gonna take over and those leaves will have served their purpose and they will all of a sudden wither away and fall to the ground. That was Mel Robbins, your friend who has a degree in botany. No, just kidding. I uh, wanna touch on one point from what I said on the trail before we get into this energy exchange and how you're going to use your intuition and the fact that you deserve to have an exchange, a reciprocal nature to what you give and what you receive back from it. I want to talk about one thing that I said, which is the leaves served their purpose. When the leaves are green, the leaves are bringing energy to the tree, and the tree is returning energy in the form of water. The reason why the leaves start to change is because the tree starts to pull back. The tree starts pulling back on the amount of water that it is sending to the leaves. The tree is starting to let go. The leaf no longer serves a purpose. And this is an important thing to say because so often we have trouble letting go of friendships, of habits, of jobs, of, for me, where I lived and raised our kids for 26 years. We recently sold our home. And by God, I held on to that for probably two years longer than we needed to because I had trouble letting go go. But what I want you to focus on is that when something has a purpose in your life, that's an amazing thing. And it's also normal for something to serve a purpose during a specific period of time and to no longer serve a purpose in your life now or in the life you want to create. And so when you honor that a friendship served a purpose, and a really good example of this is, you know how whenever you um, have a new job or you move an apartment or you move to a city, that all of a sudden the patterns in your life change and your friendships change. And your friendships change because now you're doing different things. So you're bumping into different people. It doesn't mean that you're no longer friends with the people that you used to hang out with at work. 
But the friends that you had at work served a particular important purpose during that period of your life. There was an equal exchange back and forth. What you gave, you received back. It's why you ate lunch with the same people every day. You enjoyed them and they enjoyed you. But now that you live somewhere else, putting a ton of energy back into that relationship when you're not going to get the same back, it doesn't serve the same purpose. And that's why when you let go of friendships, you also need to let go of the judgment on yourself, like there's something wrong with me, and am I doing something wrong, and do I have any friends? Of course you have friends. The patterns of your life have changed. You're putting energy somewhere else because you're getting energy from somewhere else. This is the natural cycle of life. It's the natural cycle of relationships. And I find that when you really honor the things that you need to let go of, whether it's a job you no longer like or a house you no longer want to live in or a friendship you don't see very often, or maybe it's some habit, maybe it's some habit that you used to have. So when you say something serves a purpose, you actually honor. You honor the energy it used to give you. You honor the fact that you put something into it. And you also honor the fact that not everything is going to be in your life forever. And that's what allows you to let go. You start to let go when you realize that holding on to things is holding you back. And in particular, holding on to the guilt and the judgment that you layer onto yourself that you should, but I feel guilty, but this, but that, that is definitely holding you back from creating a new life and from creating space for something new to happen. And see, that's one of the reasons why you have to learn how to let go. Because when you continue to pour your energy into things that no longer give you energy back, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill your happiness. It's going to kill your vitality. It destroys your motivation. It makes you feel depleted. It makes you feel like you're the last on your list. And so that's reason number one. And the second reason why you have to start to let go of what doesn't serve you is because as long as you are holding on to the old stuff, you have no time, no space, and no motivation to create anything new, period. And you know this. And we are talking about confidence. And I'm really excited because I'm going to walk you through the five simple tools that help you build this as a skill. And tool number one, take action. This is obvious. I understand. We have the definition of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. You're not going to change your life or build confidence by thinking about the things you need to do. You must take action. And so the best action to take, the number one tool for helping you take action in those moments where you feel imposter syndrome or you feel nervous or you're embarrassed or you start to doubt yourself or you feel anxious, whatever the feeling is, forget the feeling. Screw the feeling. We got to take action in those moments because remember, we're building confidence. It's going to require you to try. Just use my five-second rule. I told you the whole story about how I created it, the science behind it in the episode we released way back in the day called Motivation is Garbage. I'll link to that. But if you're brand new to the podcast, let me give you the shortcut. When you're in a situation where you start to doubt yourself, you're just going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and then you physically move within five seconds. So here's how you can use it. Heather's talking about the fact that she wants to build confidence in this new role where she's been promoted. There are things that she needs to do as a new leader, but she doesn't have the competency yet. Instead of thinking about those things, she can use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt that self-doubt, which is right there in the interior part of your brain and your basal ganglia. It's a pattern to doubt yourself. And as you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, your mind switches gears and your prefrontal cortex gets involved. And that's the part of the brain that controls your focus. It helps you interrupt thoughts and feelings of self-doubt. And it draws the part of your brain that will help you take action will help you engage in strategic thinking, will help you encode new behavior and habits. It will help you tap into your courage. That's it. 
That's all that it is for Alex, who is surrounded by all these high achievers. The next time she's sitting in a classroom and she has something that she wants to share, instead of shrinking in her seat, she's going to try. And the five-second rule is going to help. Five, four, three, two, one. And then she's going to shoot that hand up in the air because you know what? Alex has something to say. And even though she doesn't feel comfortable, even though she might get a neck rash, even though her cheeks might go fire engine red, and even though she might stutter or stumble or have dry mouth or whatever might happen, five, four, three, two, one, she is willing to try. Because here's something I want you to understand. You can tap into courage before you start having that feeling of assuredness. Courage is what you tap into. Confidence is what you're building over time. I'm going to say that again. Courage comes first. Courage, five, four, three, two, one. You start counting backwards, man, that is an act of courage because you're going for it. Courage comes first. Confidence is what builds over time. How cool is that, right? I absolutely love this because what I'm ultimately teaching you, and this again relates to all the research, is that there's two types of people out there. There are people who think about what they want to do, and then there are people that find the courage to take action. And that's what I want for you because you're not going to think your way out of fear or doubt or insecurity. You're not going to think your way through your fears and anxiety. The fact is you have greatness inside you, and I want you to start tapping into it. It's only through action that you unlock that power inside you and you become the person that you're meant to be. I mean, that's how I, that's how I've created the life that I have now. If I didn't learn how to five, four, three, two, one, push myself to try, I'd still be sleeping in a bed, staring at the ceiling, consumed with anxiety, feeling like I had ruined my life. That's how you change your life. You have to take action over and over and over again. And so I think you get this. You get that you're not going to change or build confidence by thinking about doing this. Five, four, three, two, one, stop thinking and start taking some risks. Start trying. Put a bet on yourself. Let's freaking go. Now let's do rule number two. Rule number two is if you personally... Just tremble in your boots when you think about doing the things that you'd love to do. Let's get back to you. Let's get selfish. What is it that more confidence would have you be doing differently? When you think about those things, speaking up at work, launching your business, tackling your health issues, putting your online dating profile up and getting yourself back out there because you're ready and you've healed and the heartbreak is over and you're ready to have some fun again. When you start thinking about how confidence would change your life, I guarantee you, you're still going to feel a little nervous. So here's a second tool that's going to help you try. You can use the power of objectivity, okay? Let's make it less personal. Be the person you want to become or create an alter ego. This can be fun, you know? We don't have to like white knuckle this this confidence thing. Let's have some fun with it because there's a study out of Johns Hopkins that I love And it's about letting go of self-doubt. And the study suggests that when you use an alter ego or you create a vision of the future you, the person you want to become, it gives you distance from the scaredy cat you who's never done this thing before. So ask yourself, you know what I always ask myself? I go, well, what would The Rock do in this situation? I just love Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. I constantly use him as my avatar when it comes to confidence. What would The Rock do in this moment? And I always get an answer, and it feels less personal. Because you and I are friends. You can use The Rock. You can use me. What would Mel do if you're feeling unsure and you want to tap into the confidence that you kind of pick up on for me? And this also taps into a entire body of research that I talk about a lot on the Mel Robbins podcast, which is behavioral activation therapy. Decades of research show that when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future now, in your present life, it's one of the fastest ways for you to change your mindset, for you to create new habits. Why? Because when you start acting like the person you want to become in the future, you start acting like that person today, what are you doing? You're trying. (laughs) You're trying to act 
like the future you would act. So let's go back to our first question, Heather. When she acts like the Heather two years from now, who's now gotten another promotion because she just slayed it in this role, the Heather today is trying to be the Heather she wants to become. Isn't that cool? Alex sitting in the classroom, surrounded by all these high achievers. When she acts like the Alex she wants to be two years from now, who's earned her doctorate, who is one of those high achievers, who is a bit more vocal, who is able to express her ideas. When she acts like that version of herself now, what is she doing? She's trying. How cool is this? It all just ladders right back to the research. That's why you can trust what I'm telling you. Another tool that you can use to build the skill of confidence is prepare. Because the more that you practice something, the more you're trying and the more competent you're going to be. So if you are nervous and you can't shake the nerves, double down on preparing. That's right. Do rehearsals. Run through it. Why? Because every time you rehearse something, you're trying it and it gives your mind and your nervous system the ability to lower the stress because your mind and your nervous system have prepared so you know what's coming. See, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice prepares you. And what's one other thing about practice? What's the first thing that you learned about confidence? Again, I come back to the definition. It's the willingness to try. That's how you put the definition into life, by practicing. Preparing for something, practicing something over and over and over, whether you're, you know, like uh, like the Williams sisters who literally stood there and hit balls 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 before they were even allowed to enter a tournament. What were they doing? They're building the skill of confidence. You want to be confident? Prove it by preparing. I use this all the time. You know, a lot of people, I laugh like, you know, you, you see me get in front of a, a YouTube camera or you see me walk onto a stage or you listen to one of my audio books. You're like, how do you do that? I've prepared. Because <laughs> you know, like, when you're ready, I mean, just think back in your own life. Think about those moments in high school or college where you weren't prepared for the test. How nervous were you? You were shaking in your boots. You couldn't even concentrate. You knew walking into the test that you were screwed. Now think about a moment when you actually studied, which is just you practicing. You feel calmer, more assured. Why? Because you were willing to try by sitting in the stacks in the library instead of going out and cracking open the books. And that's what I'm talking about. This is something you build. Let me tell you about tool number four. I love this. This is a mindset reframe. Because you got the five-second rule, you've got the power of objectivity, what would Mel or The Rock do, you've got preparation, and now let me give you a mindset trick. I love this. I tell myself all the time why it's worth trying. The reason why I tell myself why it's worth trying, why is it worth trying something if I'm only going to fail? Why is it worth going for it if I can't make my dreams come true? I'll tell you why. Because everything that you do in life is preparing you for something that hasn't happened yet. What did I tell you about confidence? Confidence is not something you build when you're winning. I think oftentimes when we're winning, what gets built is arrogance and bravado. And we forget what went into winning at something in the first place. True confidence, the skill of confidence, it's forged in fire. I mean, I've failed more times than... I have time to tell you. You guys know that a decade ago, talk about failure, 800 grand in debt, unemployed, drinking my way through my problems, and all of that heartbreak and headache and breakdown in my life, which was horrendous to go through, it led me to the five-second rule. If there was no debt, there was no drinking, there was no heartache, there would be no five-second rule. When I was a talk show host, I, here I was taping a talk show at CBS Broadcast Center here in New York City. It was a dream of mine to be able to have a daytime talk show. It gets canceled. It was leading me somewhere. Where? To this podcast, which is my most favorite thing that I've ever done in my career. See, I choose not to stay in a place of self-doubt. 
I choose not to wallow in failure because I know that life is always preparing you for something. And I know that your greatest failures, your biggest heartbreaks, they always teach you the most important lessons in life. You know, and, and I keep getting questions from you guys. Mel, oh my God, you're so confident. Like what? You're 54 years old. You keep reinventing yourself. You keep trying new things like this podcast. What is it inside you, Mel? What is it inside me? that makes me take all these risks, that makes me constantly try new things, that makes me willing to fail, to do something embarrassing or even disastrous. I'll tell you what it is. I want to get as much out of this life as I possibly can. And if you look at the math, I'm halfway through it. And it scares me to think that I could be on my deathbed and look back on my life and say, I wish I had tried that. I wish I had had the confidence to try that. I do not want to die and have regrets. And so while I'm here, while I'm breathing, while I'm able to, I am going to follow my curiosity. I am going to follow my heart. I am going to try new things. I am going to do absolutely everything that I can do to grow, to feel, to learn, and that's going to require me to take risks. That's going to require me to fuck up things. That's going to require me to look stupid. And I'm willing to do that because I know on the other side of the biggest heartbreaks of your life are the most amazing heart-filled moments. I know that in the middle of every failure that I experience, and boy, I experience them oftentimes of my own doing, every single failure has, honest to God, equipped me with the lessons and the skill or the wisdom that I needed to be able to do something even cooler down the line. And I can prove it to you. Just, just look back on one of the scariest moments of your life, one of the biggest things that you just blew. I bet you can tell me that that horrible thing that happened, that really hard thing that in the moment you were like, why is this happening to me? That right now, no matter what your life looks like, you can sit here and you know exactly what you learned from it. You know that you would not be the person you are today had it not been for that thing that you experienced, that you survived, that you learned from. And so what drives me is just wanting to experience as much as I can from this one life that I have. And it's not all going to be a joyride. And so I'm willing to take the risk. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to look stupid. And I'm willing to do it because I think the payoff that you get, it's worth it. It's so worth it. So this moment, it's preparing me for something that hasn't happened yet. And that free, that reframe, what it does is it helps me put failure and heartbreak and all the hard shit in life into a box that is something that stays by my side as I move forward instead of a wall or a block or an obstacle that stops me from continuing to move forward. Because that's how you move forward. You continue to try. And the final tool when it comes to building the skill of confidence is you have to focus on you because nobody's coming. Like nobody's going to try for you. Nobody is going to be there to motivate you to try. Nobody's going to be there to give you the pep talk. I'm here twice a week. I, I, it really is my mission that these episodes and our relationship through this podcast is one where you feel empowered and encouraged and you're reminded of who you are, that this is like a little reset, a pep talk, that you get the tools and the encouragement and the high five that you need. But ultimately, it's up to you. And you got to learn how to stop looking at the world around you and what everybody and their mother is doing. And you got to look right back in the mirror because you are the one person that you're going to spend your whole life with. And it's time that you start to focus on that person and getting into a better relationship with that person called you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.